Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenters are Dr. Amy Tun and Dr. Bascari Pila. Dr. Tun graduated from the University of California, Davis with a Bachelor of Science degree in Microbiology and completed medical school at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, where she received the Dean's Recognition Award. Dr. Tun practices medicine at Washington Township Medical Foundation in Fremont. Dr. Biscari Pila received her medical degree at Andra Medical College and completed a rotating internship at King George Hospital in India. She then completed her internship at Charles R. Drew University of Medicine in Los Angeles, followed by her residency in general pediatrics at Phoenix Children's Hospital in Arizona. After earning her American Board of Pediatrics certification in 2010, Dr. Pila has gained a wealth of experience in both inpatient and outpatient ambulatory settings, most recently as a hospitalist at Washington Hospital in Fremont. Her passion for children began in her hometown in India, where many children could not afford health care. Dr. Pila practices medicine at Washington Township Medical Foundation in Fremont. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, for our topic, Understanding the Basics of Pediatric Immunizations. I'm going to start out the talk, and then Dr. Pila will be joining us later, and she'll be talking about vaccine safety. So the objectives of this talk is to educate families to make informed decisions about immunizations, to review the history of vaccines, as well as the effectiveness of vaccines. We're going to talk about the schedule of routine childhood immunizations, the safety of vaccines, as well as common questions about vaccines. Originally, when we were planning this talk, we wanted to talk about new vaccines, but we have so much, um, so much information to cover, um, we decided new vaccines would be better for a separate uh, presentation. We have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, to really understand vaccines, we need to go back in time and look at the history of vaccines. Diphtheria, polio, rubella, measles, do any of these diseases ring a bell? Well, for a lot of us, we've never seen what these look like, and they represent obscure diseases of years past. But in the 1900s, these diseases affected many lives, particularly those of children. A little more than a century ago, the U.S. infant mortality rate was a staggering 20%. Thanks to the modern era of childhood immunizations, parents can protect their children against most of the serious infectious diseases. However, modern vaccine development is a relatively recent achievement. So let's go back in time now and take a look at smallpox. This disease paved the way for understanding how to vaccinate. For those of us who've never seen smallpox, this is what it looks like. And you can see here a man with the smallpox lesions. The next slide will show us a close-up of the smallpox lesions. So here's a picture of the smallpox rash. It initially starts out as a flat red rash. And after a couple of days, the bumps become filled with fluid and then later pus. Scabs will then form over this, and then the blisters will fall off. Evidence exists that the Chinese employed smallpox inoculation as early as 1000 CE. So they developed a technique called variolation. This is the deliberate infection with smallpox. People would then contract a mild form of the disease by breathing in the dried smallpox scabs, and then on recovery, they would be immune to smallpox. By 1700, variolation was practiced in Africa, India, and Turkey. In late 1700, Edward Jenner, um, who was a doctor in England, noticed that some dairy maids seemed protected from smallpox 
if they had a past infection by the much less dangerous virus that caused cowpox. So in 1796, Jenner conducted an experiment and also performed the world's first vaccination. What he did was he inoculated an eight-year-old boy with pus from a cowpox lesion on a milkmaid's hand. Six weeks later, he repeated the experiment and he used um, a small amount of smallpox instead. What he found was the boy was unaffected by the smallpox and he remained immune against the deadly virus. And then another 100 years passed before Louis Pasteur's 1885 rabies vaccine made an impact on human disease. And during that time, there were a lot of advances made in the study of bacteria, and a lot of developments rapidly followed. Antitoxins and vaccines against diphtheria, tetanus, cholera, plague, typhoid, and more were developed through the 1930s. So what is a vaccine? Well, it's a biological preparation that improves immunity to a particular disease. In general, a vaccine contains an agent that resembles the, a disease-causing microorganism, such as a weakened or killed form of the germ, its toxin, or one of its parts. This agent then stimulates the body's immune system to recognize the agent as foreign, destroy it, and then remember it. When these germs invade again, the immune system can more easily recognize and destroy them faster. So here's a, a really nice video from Nova, and it really does a great job of showing how immunity and vaccines work. Immunity is a natural defense system of the human body. Imagine millions of immune cells, like white blood cells, all on the lookout for specific germs. If they spot something dangerous, like flu, they prepare to fight. When that flu bug enters your body, the white blood cells move in on it. The immune cells arm themselves and then replicate, creating an army of clones. Then they launch powerful germ-killing agents called antibodies, and they tag the germs for disposal. Once the germ is removed, the immune army can disband. But they leave behind memory cells. Their job is to remember the invader and to sound the alarm if it ever appears again. The first time around, it can take at least a week to mount the defense. But next time, the system is prepared. The whole process takes barely a day. It's so fast, we may never have time to even feel sick. A vaccine pre-arms the immune system by sending in a weakened or dead version of the germ, just enough to be recognized. The immune cells mount the defense, and again, you may feel the effect. But because the threat is low, the immune cells quickly disband. However, the all-important memory cells have been created. The immune system's now prepared for the real germ, but without causing full-scale disease. Okay, now that we've looked at this great video, we're going to talk about some diseases in the pre-vaccine era, and we're going to use these diseases to highlight the efficacy of vaccines. First, we're going to talk about poliomyelitis, also known as polio. Polio is a very infectious disease that's caused by a virus that mainly affects children. It's spread from person to person uh, via the fecal oral route. When it gets into the body, it invades the nervous system and can cause paralysis. So here's a picture of a child um, who has um, been paralyzed from the legs down. And it highlights how this disease affects primarily children under the age of five. The polio virus can even paralyze the muscles that we use to breathe. So here's a picture of a person whose um, lungs have been affected by the polio virus and they're placed in this iron lung machine, which enables them to breathe. In the late 1940s to the early 1950s, polio outbreaks in the US increased. 
in frequency and in size. During that time, an average of 35,000 people in the U.S. were crippled each year by polio. It was one of the most feared diseases of the 20th century, with parents frightened to let their children go outside, especially in the summer when the virus seemed to peak. Here's another picture of a child who's been affected by the polio, by, uh, polio disease. Here's another picture of a person and an iron lung um, during the Rhode Island polio epidemic of 1960. We're going to talk about how, the efficacy of the polio vaccine now. In 1954, a group of children in Pennsylvania were the first to receive the new polio, virus, polio, I'm sorry, polio vaccine invented by Dr. Jonas Salk. After that, mass inoculations began, and we saw a big decrease in cases of polio. The cases of polio in the U.S. dropped from 14,647 in 1955 to 5,894 in 1956. Due to the effectiveness of the polio vaccine, the U.S. has been polio-free since 1979. Here we have a picture of a crowd awaiting polio immunizations in San Antonio in 1962. Because of widespread vaccination, polio was eliminated from the Western Hemisphere in 1994. As of 2015, polio virus does remain endemic in Afghanistan, Nigeria, and Pakistan. And thus, polio vaccination is still recommended worldwide because of the risk of imported cases. I want to display how disruptions in government and health programs can set back the advancements made by widespread vaccination. For example, the Syrian, polio, uh, Syrian political crisis, which started in 2011, has caused interruption of health programs and displacements of millions of people, leading to the reappearance of polio. There have been no polio in Syria since 1999, but outbreaks began again in 2013. The World Health Organization launched an emergency immunization drive to control spread of the disease. By the end of 2013, there were 25 polio cases reported in Syria. Globally, um, polio cases have increased from 222 in 2012 to 372 in 2013, mainly from reintroductions of polio to several countries that have been polio-free in 2012, specifically Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, and Syria. Now I'm going to talk about a disease called HIM which stands for Haemophilus influenza type B. It's a type of bacteria that can be spread from person to person in droplets through sneezing and coughing. When the bacteria gets into the lungs or bloodstream, it can cause meningitis, which is an infection of the lining of the brain. It can cause pneumonia. It can cause epiglottitis, which is an infection of the throat. And it can also cause infections of the blood, joints, or bones. Here's a picture of a child who's been affected by the Hib um, bacteria. They have developed a swollen face from the, an infection due to the Hib bacteria. Prior to the Hib vaccine, about 20,000 children in the US under the age of five got Hib disease annually, and about three to 6% of those died. Also before the vaccination, about 12,000 children per year, mostly under the age of five, got Hib meningitis. Since the introduction of the first Hib vaccine in the late 1980s, the number, of Hib, the number of cases of invasive Hib disease has decreased significantly by more than 99%. This graph exemplifies the success of the Hib vaccine. We can see um, on this side over here is the incidence of Hib disease per 100,000 in the population. This graph is showing the estimated annual incidence of invasive Hib disease in children less than the age of five in the United States between 1980 to 2012. We can see before the vaccine was introduced um, in 1985, there was a peak in Hib disease. When the vaccine was introduced in 1985, we saw, we saw a drop in Hib disease. And again, later on, in 1990, Hib vaccine for children older than the age of two months was introduced, and you see a significant decline in Hib disease. 
Now we're going to talk about measles, which many of us have been hearing about in the news due to the recent outbreak that started in Disneyland the beginning of this year. So what is measles? It's a highly contagious viral infection, which is spread from person to person by droplets through sneezing and coughing. Measles starts first with a fever, runny nose, cough, and red eyes, and it's followed by a rash that spreads over the body. Here's a picture of the characteristic measles rash affecting the head and shoulders of a boy. Measles can cause serious health complications, especially in children under the age of five. And these complications include blindness, encephalitis, which is an infection that causes brain swelling, severe diarrhea, ear infections, or pneumonia. One to two out of 1,000 people with measles will die, even with the best care. Before the first measles vaccine became available in 1963, there were more than 500,000 cases of measles reported each year in the United States. And there are about 500 deaths and 4,000 people with encephalitis each year. Due to a highly effective vaccination program, measles declined to a low of 37 cases in 2004. However, measles is still common in many parts of the world, including um, some countries in Europe, Asia, as well as Africa. Worldwide, there's an estimated 20 million people who will get measles, and 146,000 people, mostly children, will die from the disease each year. In recent years, there have been spikes in measles outbreaks, including 644 cases in 2014. Most of these U.S. outbreaks begin with people who were infected internationally with the disease spreading quickly in areas where vaccination rates are low. Fear of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine has caused a decline in vaccination rates, putting young infants, pregnant women, and people with weakened immune systems at risk. This group of people who cannot receive the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine rely on herd immunity to protect them from measles. In herd immunity, a critical portion of a population is immunized against a contagious disease. When most members of the community are protected against that disease, there's little opportunity for an outbreak. But to work, a certain percentage of people in a community must be vaccinated. In the case of measles, for herd immunity to work, at least 96% of the population needs to be vaccinated. Now we're going to talk about the routine schedule of immunizations. So this is um, um, a, t a chart showing the recommended immunization schedule from the Centers for Disease Control for children birth through six years of age. And you see, as you can see, the immunizations are given in repeated doses. For example, the Hib vaccine, it's given at two months of age, four months of age, six months of age, and lastly, between 12 to 15 months of life. Now, you may be wondering, why are the vaccines given multiple times? Well, first, we need to talk about who determines the schedule. Every year, top disease and public health experts work together on a schedule that will provide the best protection from diseases. The schedule is then approved by a number of organizations, including the American Academy of Pediatrics. What are the reasons for this schedule? Well, the timing and spacing of the vaccines are scheduled for the age when the body's immune system will work the best. The purpose is to protect infants and children at the earliest age possible before they are exposed to potentially life-threatening diseases. This group is the most acceptable and the consequences of these diseases can be serious. So why are multiple doses needed? Depending on the vaccine, more than one dose is needed, and researchers have determined that multiple doses may be needed to build high enough immunity to prevent disease, such as in the case of the Hib vaccine. Sometimes multiple doses are needed to boost immunity that weakens over time, such as in the case of the Tdap vaccine, which is also known as the whooping cough booster shot. Sometimes multiple doses are needed to protect against germs that change over time, such as in the influenza vaccine. This virus changes every year. Sometimes multiple doses are needed to protect people who do not develop immunity from a first dose, such as the MMR vaccine. So now Dr. Pila is going to join you guys and talk to you about vaccine safety. Hi, I'm Dr. Baskari Pila. I'm continuing the rest of the topic. 
uh, starting with vaccine safety and development. Talking about vaccine development, it's a very long and a complex process. It takes about 10 to 15 years for the vaccine to be developed. It consists of three parts like a pre-licensure testing, approval and getting the license, and the post-licensure monitoring of the vaccines. The first, the federal government, particularly the Food and Drug Administration involved in testing the vaccines prior to being licensed. The first, the vaccines are tested in the laboratory using the computer models, where the scientists learn about the disease and its genetic codes. They identify um, the natural and the synthetic antigens that can be used to provoke the immune response in the human beings so that it can prevent the disease from them. Later on, this has, secondly, it is tested in animals. The most common animals involved in the testing of the vaccines are monkeys and mouses because they have a similar immune response like human beings. The candidate vaccines are administered in them to see if, if they have any major side effects, is it safe, and it is worth giving that vaccine, is it providing enough protection from the disease. Later on, and most of the studies abruptly end at this stage because they won't go beyond the stage as either they are not safe or they're not effective in providing the adequate protection for the diseases. Once they pass beyond the stage, that includes the human trials, which goes in three phases. In phase one, human trial involves few people, like less than 100, where the, the candidate vaccine is administered to see is it safe and effective in producing the response, protective response. Once they pass, they, they go into phase two trials, where a couple of hundred people are involved again to see the safety and the effectiveness of the vaccine. And also they determine the correct dose to be given so that adequate response is acquired by giving the vaccine. The route of the vaccine given and also the correct number of doses that are needed to be given to produce the enough protective response. With this, it moves on to phase three trial where it includes a large number of people involving a couple of thousands of people. The benefit of using the large number of population is to surface the real side effects which were not evident in the prior trials. With that um, series of three clinical phases, after a successful phase three trial and the biological license application is submitted to FDA. Then the FDA will inspect the factory the vac where the vaccines are going to be made and approve the labeling and the vaccine. And FDA continue to monitor, to uh, monitor the vaccines. The most post-licensure monitoring of vaccines involve vaccine adverse events, reporting system called VAERS, the vaccine safety data link project, the clinical immunization safety assessment centers, and the Institute of Medicine Vaccine Safety Reviews. I would like to talk to you about the first two, which are most commonly in, uh, utilized. Coming to the VAERS, the CDC and the FDA established the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System in 1990. It is a totally a voluntary reporting system. The registering of the adverse events means, the vaccine adverse event doesn't mean they, they cause the event, but it's just a mere, it may be a mere coincidence too, which I will go through soon. The VAERS receives more than 20,000 reports per year. And here's the contact number for you to see it's 1-800-822-7967 and the website is www.vaers.hhs.gov where feel, please feel free to go to the website and review the data about that. The type of adverse events reported to VAERS are vaccine, reaction, or the side effect. Is that response potentiated by giving that vaccine, or is just a human error, or is just a mere coincidental? So what, will, what does the VAERS do with all the reports received? The CDC monitors the data to detect any new or unusual vaccine adverse event, monitor the increase in the known adverse events, 
and identify the potential patient risk factors for particular type of adverse events. And also, is the adverse event particularly related to a single lot of vaccine and assess the safety of newly licensed vaccines. Later, uh, then let's move on to the vaccine safety data link. This is a collaborative effort of between the CDC and the eight health maintenance organizations in the United States. It covers around 2.5% of US population. The advantages of this type of HMO-wide approach to study the vaccine safety issues are large population with unique ID and the computerized linkable administrative data base and a powerful tool for providing the data to establish the casualty. The third one I would like to just briefly mention here is the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Centers. They are designed to conduct the research of the adverse events following the immunizations. They study the pathophysiology of the adverse events, they identify the risk factors, and also develop an evidence-based guidance to assist clinicians in their decision making when assessing and managing the adverse events following the immunizations. That, with that knowledge, let's move on to vaccine management. So we have known how the vaccines are developed and how they're approved and how they're monitored. Let's move on to vaccine management. The vaccine storage. Vaccines should be, the time the uh, vaccines are manufactured, till the vaccine is uh, administered to the patient, it should be stored adequately. And the vaccine storage and handling in, include both manufacturer and the provider obligations. As the manufacturer obligation is to maintain proper environment controls during the shipping, like the cold chain with its temperature controlled supply chain. The provider obligation ensures the vaccine stock maintains its safety and effectiveness. The proper, the, the providers uh, check the proper condition and arrival of the vaccines. There are vaccine coordinators in each and every clinic where they receive the vaccines, they check is the vaccine received in proper condition. Then they store the vaccines appropriately because few vaccines are stored in the refrigerator and few vaccines are stored in the freezer. We have to make sure the correct temperature is maintained so that it is safe and it doesn't lose any of its effectiveness. And the shelf life, just making sure the vaccines are stored between 18 months to three years, not more than that. And also rotate the stock so the shortest dated material are used first, maintaining the timing and the spacing of the vaccines. This is a quick picture of the uh, storage, vaccine storage used in the clinics. See how they are widely spaced and they're labeled with their lot numbers and the expiry date. And they maintain the, the water bottles bottom there just to make sure the coolness and effectiveness is maintained in case of emergency power failure. Not only that, it's a responsibility of the, uh, of the, um, the clinicians is to maintain the administrative, administering the vaccines appropriately, like using the correct technique and the equipment in administering the vaccines. For example, some vaccines like live vaccines, like MMR and chickenpox should be administered under the skin and few other vaccines can be given in the muzzle. And some vaccines like rotavirus should be given through the mouth and some vaccines like Influmist can be given in the nose. They have to make sure the vaccines are administered appropriately. And using the correct equipment means using the correct size of the needle and the proper length and the proper grass to prevent the unnecessary local reactions like swelling and any vascular tissue injury or any systemic reactions. This is the temperature control setting recommended by the CDC, just to make sure, making sure the refrigerator vaccines on the top. This is adequate temperature and coming to the freezer section, this is like minus 58 degrees to the five degree Fahrenheit. This is the temp vaccine temperature log. They have to maintain in all the, on all the refrigerators, periodically checking the vaccine temperature, just making sure the vaccines are safe and effective. With this knowledge, let's move on to the vaccine components. We have seen the vaccines are developed and how they are stored, and now let's talk about the vaccine components. 
Vaccine have a lot of other components apart to the antigens like preservatives, which helps to prevent the growth of microorganisms like bacteria and fungi. Thimer salt was most common used preservative, but now it is limited just to multi-dose vials of flu vaccine. The other preservatives used are phenols, benzothium chloride, and 2-phenoxyethanol. The other components of vaccines are adjuvants. They help to stimulate the body's response to the antigens so that they can fight the infection better when they're really exposed to one. The most common adjuvant used is aluminum salts and monophosphoryl lipid A. The other vaccine components are the stabilizers like sugar and gelatin to keep the vaccine potent during the transportation and storage. The residual cell culture material like egg protein to grow enough of the virus or the bacteria to make, sure, to make the vaccine. And the formaldehyde, which is a residual inactivating ingredient to kill the unwanted viruses or to inactivate the toxins during the manufacturing process. The residual antibiotics like neomycin is used to prevent the unwanted growth of the bacteria during the vaccine manufacturing. Let's talk about a few common uh, ingredients. I chose a few of them like thimerosal, which is a mercury containing, uh, ethyl mercury containing organic compound used as a preservative in vaccines. This thimerosal compound is metabolized to ethyl mercury and thiosalicylate. And around 0.01% of thimerosal is used as a preservative, which gives, delivers around only just 25 micrograms of mercury per dose of the vaccine. So there are a lot of studies about mercury, the fear of mercury. Let's, let's talk about that. Mangos et al. compared the toxicity between ethyl versus methyl mercury by injecting the equal amounts of ethyl mercury and methyl mercury in, in, in the rats, both male and female rats, by gavage feeds. And then they have shown the ethyl mercury, the mercury derivative found in thimerosal, is less neurotoxic than methyl mercury. And CDC also published a new study in England, New England Journal of Medicine. Um, they studied around uh, the early ex thimerosal exposure in the, and the neural psychological outcomes at 7 to 10 years of uh, age, and they have proven it is not really affecting the outcome. This is one of the Danish studies I would like to show you. This is the in incidence of the autism spectrum disorder, and this is a calendar year, and this red line here shows when the thimerosal was discontinued. It has shown that the autism spectrum disorder incidence has been rising adequately even after the thimerosal was discontinued in the vaccines. That's very reassuring just to make sure the thimerosal is not associated with any of the neuropsychological um, abnormalities in kids. In 2001, as a precautionary measure, thimerosal was removed in all the US vaccines given to the kids less than six years of age and reduced in certain other vaccines. Even there's no evidence of harm. For more details, you can review this website, the cdc.gov website. Let's move on to aluminum. Aluminum salts are used as adjuvants that boost the immune response to vaccines. The effects of aluminum were discovered way back in 1926. Aluminum adjuvants are used in all the vaccines except for the live vaccines like MMR, chickenpox, and rotavirus. And the quantities of aluminum present in the vaccines are low and are regulated by the Centers for Biology Evaluation and Research. It's very interesting to know that aluminum contained in the vaccine is similar to that found in one liter of infant formula. Infants receive about 4.4 milligrams of aluminum in the first six months of life, providing they, they got all the scheduled vaccines, while the breastfed infant in just about seven milligrams in the first six months of life. With the formula, the milk protein formula fed babies get about 38 milligrams, while the soy based formula babies get in just about 117 milligrams of aluminum. These are roughly it, the, varies, the concentration of aluminum varies in different vaccines. That's, I just want to point out that. So aluminum is pretty safe 
for the babies, it doesn't have any serious side effects. Let's move on to the vaccine, separating fears from facts. When we talk about vaccines, the most common fear comes from most of the people is autism, right? And MMR is the one is linked to autism in the past, but no more. Let's talk about that. The suggestion that MMR might lead to autism had its origin in the research by Dr. Wakefield, a gastroenterologist in the United Kingdom in 1998. This study is later proved as a bias study followed by multiple research done in this field. I would like to point out about two big studies that were done and published. One was published in 2012. It's a Cochrane database system which reviewed about uh, it's a literature review about five randomized control tires, one control clinical trial, and 27 cohort studies, and 17 case studies, and five time series trials, and one case crossover trials, multiple studies in involving around 14 million children, and assessing the effectiveness of the vac safety of the vaccines with the, between the duration of 2004 and 2011. It has concluded that exposure to MMR vaccine was unlikely associated with autism, asthma, leukemia, or any other autoimmune problems. For more details of this study, you can go through this link, the NCBI, for the more details of the study. The other interesting study, and which is the latest study I would like to talk about, is a study uh, which was <coughs> published in JAMA in April of 2015. This has involved about 95,000 children in the United States with private medical insurance, and that with few of them have older siblings with autism spectrum, few have normal siblings. The autism, the receipt of MMR vaccine was not associated with increased risk of autism spectrum disorder, regardless of whether the older siblings had autism spectrum disorder or not. These findings indicate there is no casual association with MMR or autism spectrum disorder. Let's move on to the next fear. Since the flu season has come, I would like to talk to you about the egg allergy and the influenza vaccine. The CDC, in cooperation with American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, no longer consider egg allergy as a reason to avoid the flu shot. The amount of egg protein in the flu vaccine is very low. It's way below one microgram per ml, which is far less than the concentration which was used in the prior doses of flu vaccine. In 2014, the latest update on egg allergy in the flu shot. If, if a child is having a mild allergic reaction to eggs, like just like skin reactions, like only hives, the vaccine can be safely administered in the pediatrician's office provided they observe for the next 30 minutes in the office. If the reaction to eating is a little bit severe, like difficulty breathing and lightheadedness, the vaccine should be ad administered in the allergy and the immunologist's office with a 30 minute observation period afterwards. There are two other new vaccines. One is made with mammalian cells. It's not with any bird cells and also with other using the recombinant DNA technology are now available for the people with egg allergies in few places, which is very interesting and I'm very happy about that. Let's go on, let's, with this knowledge, let's move on to the vaccine reactions. Vaccine adverse reactions fall in three general categories. They are the local reactions, which generally at least for most frequent, such as pain, swelling, redness at the site of the infection. The local reaction may occur in up to 50% of vaccine doses, depending on the type of the vaccine. The systemic reactions are more generalized events like fever, not feeling well, myalgias, which are muscle pain, headache, loss of appetite, and others. Coming to the allergic reactions that are caused by vaccine antigens itself, or some of the components, as we discussed earlier, um, severe and, and then like rash, hives might be seen, but very rarely. And the severe allergic reactions, like anaphylactic reactions, may also be seen based on the components used. Providers should also remember that injection can cause emotional response. 
Like some kids are fear of needles, some kids have fear of pain. So they have the vasovagal syncope, and so it's always a good idea to talk to them. Is there stress in the, in the clinic prior to giving the vaccines? I would like to talk to them before prior to administering the vaccines. Most of the pediatric staff are really good at doing that. Let's move, these are the most, I will just guideline of the vaccines. These are the most common side effects which are seen. The public health law requires um, as a clinician's provi providers to provide a vaccine information sheet either to the patient or to the parent to whatever vaccines they get, receive. It explains the known side effects, the contraindications, and the reporting vaccine adverse event and the vaccine injury and compensation. It gives us a cl clear clue for the families to see what to expect, what is there in the vaccine. So with this, we conclude the talk of vaccine safety and the immunizations.